So in 2009, I bought my first property in Texas when I was still living in Washington, D.C. So I figured my rationale was um, I'm going to buy something as a buy and hold and just see how it works. But I didn't want to get a single family property because if my tenant vacated or I had issues, I'd be left covering the entire mortgage myself. So I specifically went out and looked for a multifamily. I looked for, I bought a duplex. Um, and the way that I worked the numbers, one tenant in one of the units would cover 85% of the mortgage. And so I said, you know, that's, that's an acceptable level of risk for me. It wasn't the greatest profit amount. I mean, it was cash flowing three, $400 a month, but you know, that every little bit helps, right. especially when you're getting your feet wet in a new market. So that was my first duplex. You are listening to the Real Estate Proverbs podcast with host Kevin Jefferson. This is the number one podcast for African-American real estate professionals who are doing extraordinary things. It's time to tune in. And now your host, the people's lender, Kevin Jefferson. Kevin Jefferson. Welcome to the Real Estate Proverbs Podcast. I'm your host, Mr. Kevin Jefferson, the People's Lender. And today we've got a guest by the name, Mr. Keith Stone. How you doing, Keith? Man, as some old people say, I'm blessed and highly favored. Blessed and highly favored. Amen. <laughs> hey, Keith. So for those who uh, hadn't heard of you, tell us a little bit about who you are. Um, I'm a guy that plays in the dirt and changes real estate hands for a living. Um, I actually have a civil engineering degree, so I came from a construction management background. I've got about 17 years of construction management experience, but I started flipping properties right out of school. Um, did my first flip with some friends at 24, and I've been involved in the real estate game in one form or fashion ever since. So about Seven years ago, I decided to cut out the middleman, so to speak, and get licensed. And then I realized I'm leaving an entire segment of real estate alone. So I am a residential realtor by day. That's kind of my part-time job, but I'm really a full-time property investor and developer. So, awesome. Yep. I buy awesome. everything that has to do with real estate and sell everything that has to do with real estate. Wow. That's, that's interesting. That's interesting. So um, you say you got a civil engineer degree. Mm -hmm. Where'd you attend college? Howard University. Um, yep. Washington, D.C. So five years at Howard. And then I spent eight years working for one of the largest general contractors in the nation. Um, spent eight years working for them. Then I spent six years working for a small mom and pop general contractor with about 25 employees. And I actually learned much more at the small mom and pop contractor because you are forced to be hands on in every single aspect of the business. And then for the last five or six years, I've been a billable consultant or sometimes I'll still consult with construction, construction firms, but I work strictly for myself now. Wow. That's amazing. So, man, before we hop into it, a Howard homecoming is as good as they say they are, man. Biggie had me wanting to go to Howard homecoming. <laughs> Let's put it this way. So my first Howard homecoming was in 1998. The okay. only one I've ever missed last year because of COVID. So it's it's as advertised. Wow. Yeah. Biggie had me wanting to go to a Howard homecoming. I never made it, man. But he had me one. Man, it's not too late. <laughs> it's never too late. It's never too late. Yeah, that's awesome, man. So you said you started uh, with some buddies at the age of 24. Uh, so I take it, it like a year or two out of college. Exactly. Um, so I had a fraternity brother who was who was wealthy. And at the time, he was the only black millionaire that I had ever met. And so I sat down and talked to him one day and I was like, how did you get this? He had like a 6,000 square foot home in Washington, D.C., which was a lot. And he had a beach house in Maryland and he had all these nice toys. And I'm like, yeah, I've got a degree and I make a decent salary and I can see myself working my way up the ladder. But you don't get rich by working in corporate America most of the time. 
So I asked him, how did he do it? And he's like, I'm in real estate. And at the time he had 15 or 20 properties and he didn't get started until he was 29. And he was like, get started early. You got plenty of time. And I, I took his advice as much as possible. And I didn't quite have the capital back then because I didn't have credit and I was fresh out of school. So I got together with three or four friends and I said, hey, when y'all get your next bonus, let's not go to Miami or Vegas and trick off as 24 year olds usually do. Let's buy a house and flip it. And we, we did exactly that. We learned some lessons the hard way. We didn't make a killing, but we all made enough to get our money back and move on to the next project. And that just kind of planted a seed. So how many of you with, was it in that project? It was four of us. It was okay. four. And we literally put in uh, $12,000 each. And we got a hard money loan and we um, financed the renovation with the hard money loan and a little bit of out-of-pocket cost. And we held it a little longer because we over-improved it. You know, when you're brand new, you don't know what you're doing. We didn't listen to sound advice because we were know-it-all 24-year-olds. And when it all came said and done, we got our money back and enough profit for me to buy my first single family home on my own. Okay. Okay. So how was that deal structured uh, with it being four of you? <laughs> See, <laughs> I wish I had been able to speak to you back in uh, <laughs> 2004. We didn't even have a structure. We had a handshake agreement amongst friends. And one of the things, probably the most important thing that I learned at the time, you don't want to jump into business with everyone just because they can cut a check. Dif people have different values. People have different work ethics. So thankfully, it didn't ruin any friendships, but it taught me I need to be more selective with my business partners. If I could go back in time, I would have told fresh out of school me, this is how you structure a deal. We just kind of winged it. Thankfully, the housing market was so flush back then, you know, God looks out for fools and babies and he looked out for us that time. Gotcha, gotcha. And that was going to be my question. Are you guys still friends today? <laughs> we are still friends. I'm going to see a couple of them next weekend. We're uh, getting together and we're linking up. We don't do business anymore. Right. We're still friends. Awesome. Awesome. And you're down in uh, where are you at? I'm in Dallas, Texas, or in the suburbs of Dallas. Okay, cool, cool. Um, uh, funny, uh, today I went out uh, networking, uh, just some R&R. &R. We went to a place called Top Golf. Uh, mm -hmm. A couple of guys came, and I didn't know one of the guys. I didn't know two of them. And uh, one of the guys had just moved here in February from uh, Dallas. So he was up in, like, North Dallas. I think he said that's DeSoto or – no, I'm in DeSoto. I'm in the southern suburbs. Uh, so North what's North Dallas? Dallas? North Dallas is plain old Frisco. Those that's what he people. said. Yeah, he said plain old Frisco. That's what you, yeah. So I saw oh, that's interesting. Um, so uh, ironically, he uh, he worked for Fannie Mae, but he worked for them where the company helped them get their processes together. So he and I, yeah, we got some, some talking, some talking to do just to kind of see any insight that he could give me on something from working with them. Um, so in terms of this deal, uh, you guys made some money enough for you to become a homeowner for your own single family. Right. right. And at what point did you get, uh, back into flipping uh, to get another property. So I was living in Washington, D.C. at the time, and that market is very expensive back then, even more so now. So um, I bought my first property in Washington, D.C., my single family home in 2006. And so during that time, I, I helped crowdfund a few deals where um, through syndication, me and other people, we put in X amount of money on a flip or whatever, and we would get a return that way. So syndication works on all levels, whether you and some friends are flipping a single family home or you and some friends are buying a 200 unit apartment complex. So by syndication slash crowdfunding, um, I was involved in three or four other flips 
between 2006 and 2009. And then in 2009, I realized the way these property prices are going in DC, at the time, $300,000 would get you a property that needed a complete gut renovation. And I was just a single individual. Yeah, I was making decent salary for someone in their late 20s, but not to the point where I could jump into a flip of that nature and leave my comfort level. And I was already to the point where I was selective with my business partner, so I couldn't just do business with anyone. So my rationale was, okay, let's look for something outside of my market. So in 2009, I bought my first property in Texas when I was still living in Washington, D.C. So I figured my rationale was um, I'm going to buy something as a buy and hold and just see how it works. But I didn't want to get a single family property because if my tenant vacated or I had issues, I'd be left covering the entire mortgage myself. So I specifically went out and looked for a multifamily. I looked for, I bought a duplex. Um, and the way that I worked the numbers, one tenant in one of the units would cover 85% of the mortgage. And so I said, you know, that's, that's an acceptable level of risk for me. It wasn't the greatest profit amount. I mean, it was cash flowing three, $400 a month, but you know, that every little bit helps, right. especially when you're getting your feet wet in a new market. So that was my first duplex. Since then, my wife and I, we've used that same rationale and we've bought an additional eight or nine duplexes since then. As a matter of fact, um, before the term house hacking came around, we've been doing that. I currently live in one of my duplexes and my tenant pays my mortgage for me. So I've been living mortgage free since 2010. I still have a mortgage. Someone else just pays it for me. So we took that same approach. And when the Dallas mark, uh, market started to become saturated and price points started to fly, for instance, that first property I purchased in 2009, I'm not, a, I'm not ashamed to share this with you. I bought it for $100,000 for a two bedroom, two bathroom, two car garage duplex. Each side was identical, had two beds, two baths, two car garage, separately metered in its own yard. You know, they say hindsight is twenty twenty. If I knew what I knew now, then I would have drained my 401k, taken the tax hit, liquidated everything in Washington, D.C., and bought 30 of these. Because this same duplex, not this one, but the same duplex that I bought for $100,000, identical duplexes are selling on that block 12 years later in 380. Identical duplexes. Wow. Yeah, it's just, and it's a combination of things. One, there's a housing shortage. Two, duplexes are attractive for the same rationale that I just shared with you. There's someone else to cover the debt service. And then three, there's a lot of outside money, like myself, moving from Washington, D.C. to Texas, or from New York, Boston, L.A., San Francisco, some other highly inflated market. So a couple of years ago, my wife, who I am in business with, uh, we decided, let's scale this up. If we can do this with duplexes and triplexes and fourplexes, the next logical step is true multifamily. Let's get an apartment building, a 30 unit, a 60 unit, a 100 unit. So we delved into multifamily. So via syndication, we've got ownership in a couple of deals and we're constantly, by a couple of deals, I mean apartment complexes, uh, a 23 unit here, a 36 unit there. And if you need me to delve into syndication and how that works, I will. But for us, that was just a logical stepping stone. Yes, we've got 20, 30 doors of single family. And that's all well and dandy, but it's making us a great living. But it's not to the point where I can pay for my son's education at Stanford in 15 years. Yeah, it's, it, it'll pay for a state school for sure. Might even pay for <laughs> out. And if my son says, Dad, I want to go Ivy League. I don't want to have to move things around. I want to be able to stroke a check. So wow. uh, the next so, step for us was, okay, we could do duplexes in four units. Let's, let's get an apartment building or an apartment complex. So you say you guys have like 30 doors now? Yeah, we've got about 30 doors of single family and, and duplex. Wow. That's awesome. That's a, that's a good portfolio. But I, I understand what you're saying. 
um, in terms of scaling to where it's, uh, um, it's, it's actually not a good portfolio. Um, we could have done more. Okay. We should have done more. We will be doing more. So we have friends that came to us for counsel that we introduced to the business. They started a couple years after us. Now they're on 50 doors. So scaling isn't hard once you have the right tools in place and the right relationships. Someone like you, the people's lender, let's say I had a relationship with you 15 years ago and you are a lender at a small local bank. If I had been able to establish a commercial banking relationship with you 12 years ago, by now I would have a line of credit for $350,000 or more and I'd be able to buy more flips and buy more buy and holds and acquire more without having to jump through hoops. The reason most people don't have more, it's actually twofold. The first one is lack of knowledge. We don't know what we don't know. And a lot of the lessons we learned, we learned the hard way. If I can go back in time and talk to myself, just like everybody else, we'd be in a better position. And the other thing is fear. I will tell you that I am definitely the conservative one in the relationship. My wife is more aggressive. We kind of balance each other out. But it's like they say on every investment commercial, all investment is inherently risky. But as they, as they say in my neighborhood where I came up, scared money don't make money. Make money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so scared money don't 30 make doors money. Is, 30 doors is good, but I'll be happy when we get to 100. Okay, okay. You got a, a date stamp for that? Right now, we are adding about four doors a year, but we're going to ramp that up. We're going okay. to ramp that up. Cool, cool. Well, man, I definitely would love to hear uh, once you guys get to 100 plus, right? 100 plus. Uh, so let's talk about um, you ha house hacking, right? You're so you said you're currently living in one of your duplexes. I do. So I'm in my office. Uh, this is a three bedroom, two bathroom duplex. It's 1600 square feet. And right now it's the perfect size for my wife and my two small children. Uh, we will be moving out at the end of the year, but I've been living here since 2014 mortgage free. And wow. most people's largest monthly expense is their mortgage or your rent. So that allows us to put aside money towards savings or toward the next investment because I don't have to cover a $2,200 a month mortgage or whatever the mortgage might be in your area. Wow. So in terms of uh, other, so I know you do buy and hope, are you doing any other fixes and flips right now? So on average, we do about one flip a year just because we're just because of time constraints. Right. But right now we're adding about four doors a year to our portfolio. So a couple of the things that we've done outside of the investment, which is outside of the development, which is a whole nother monster. Um, I've recently, I started a construction company at the end of the year. And when I say I started a construction company, I didn't go out and buy trucks. I didn't go out and buy a warehouse to store two by fours in. I started an LLC, which is my own construction company, because I have vendors from fixes and flips. I have vendors from buy and holds, and I have vendors from being a residential real estate agent. I've got a guy that can pour me a slab. I've got a guy that can clear a site for me. I've got plumbers. I've got electricians. I've got framers, and I've got roofers. So when I do, so the next time I buy a piece of dirt, instead of hiring a general contractor, to pay that individual a 15 or 20% market, I will be the general contractor. I will keep that 15 to 20% markup and run it through my business entity and build credit with my construction company. So after three to five years, I'll be able to walk into my local bank or credit union that I have a relationship with and say, hey, Redstone Builders uh, needs a line of credit. And that'll be another avenue for me to pursue another investment. I might run all of my flips through my construction company, LLC, and keep my other LLC just for buy and hold to keep my liability spread around. Right. So you mentioned a development. 
let's talk about that. Uh, let's tell what you have going on. So my business partner, not my wife, but my other business partner, she's also a residential agent. She's very sharp. She's also investment minded as well. She has a portfolio similar to mine with some other little twist on it. We realized the area that we live in is a primar primarily minority suburb. Lots of African-Americans, lots of uh, Latino people. Um, price points are a little bit compressed here. So we realized part of the issue that we were having is we were dealing with young African-American and young Hispanic families who had never had the dream of home ownership before. And we'd get them, we'd help them get where they need to be credit wise and financing wise. And we'd get them pre-approved for a home. And at the time you could get yourself a very nice starter home in the Dallas suburb. A three, two would be about 200 grand, maybe 165 on the low end, 210 on the high end. That was a very nice starter home that you'd be proud to call your own and host family on Sundays. We started seeing a trend. There was a lot of outside influence and money flowing into Dallas. So we'd get these, these couples and we'd get them in the right position to buy and they'd submit an offer and they were getting beaten out by cash offers by either people from the coast, maybe someone from San Francisco or Boston who had a little extra money and they wanted to throw it into an investment similar to what I did when I was in DC, or we were dealing with hedge funds who realized there's money in real estate and it's hard to compete with the cash offer that can close in 10 days when you're FHA financing. So we said, what can we do? How can we fix this situation? There's a lack of affordable housing. Cool, let's go out and find and build our own. So what we did was we found a parcel of land about four acres, excuse me, about four miles from our office. It was 8.28 acres. It was raw land, it was just a big old grassy field, which I'm not sure where your listeners are at, but there's lots of undeveloped land here in Texas because Texas is huge. So we were able to acquire that parcel using 50% uh, financing, 50% LTV. So just to be completely honest with you, we bought the property for $250,000. My partner and I, we put down 125 and we got a bank to give us another 125. We'll go into the details of that. Okay. Uh, but before we closed, we had done a little bit of cursory research. We found out that the property was zoned TH2A. And if you're not familiar with zoning designations, that means townhouse two, which you could essentially build townhouses, duplexes, something of that nature. So anytime you look at a zoning for a property, you can go back to the zoning regs and they'll tell you the maximum density and things that are allowed. They'll say, we'll allow X amount of these per acre. So when we looked at the paperwork, we saw that the maximum density for 8.2 acres was 74 units. So we said, wow, we could potentially build 74 townhouses on this parcel in a perfect world. So we said, that's an investment worth us taking a hold of. Now, again, I come from a construction background. Uh, my partner, she's a real estate broker. She has done some, some ground up construction herself on some of her rental properties. We've done a ton of fix and flips, but we weren't developers per se but we know enough to get started. So we went out and we purchased the parcel. So a lot of people are gonna say, man, I don't have $125,000 laying around or I'm not comfortable draining my entire 401k to delve into a project like that. Neither were we, we didn't put all of our eggs in one basket. So to be completely forthright, I say, cool, I got 25 grand I can invest. My partner said, I got 25 grand I can invest. Okay, that's 50 grand. We're 75 grand short. So the question that everyone needs to ask themselves, do you know someone who's in a similar financial situation to you that you trust that has a similar value system? Maybe somebody that you worked with, friend, somebody from your fraternity, your sorority, somebody from your church. That's the basis of syndication. Most of the time, if you see a garden style apartment complex, 
that has 100 units, it's not one wealthy person who owns that apartment complex. There are usually two different types of buyers. There's either a traditional hedge fund or a REIT. A REIT is a real estate investment trust. That means people have put their money in the stock market and the people who manage their stock market money have said, I'm going to invest in real estate. So they'll take the money from 200 different mutual funds to buy an apartment complex. That's one way. The other way is syndication. Myself and Mr. Jefferson say, hey, we like the numbers on this 100 unit. I got 50 grand to put in it. He got 50 grand to put in it. Cool. We are going to name ourselves the deal sponsors. We are in charge. We're going to put in our 100 grand. Our 100 grand is going to entitle us to, let's just say, 20% of the deal. Maybe the apartment complex is worth $2 million. We all can do math. 20% of $2 million ain't 100 grand. Well, actually, it is. But still. Anyway, um, let's just say it's $5 million. We're going to say our 100 grand is worth 20% of that because one, we went out and we found the deal. We're doing legwork. We're crunching the numbers. We're doing all the dirty work. Then we're going to find five of Mr. Jefferson's friends and five of my friends who are like-minded people. Maybe it's couples who are tired of putting money in their 401k and seeing the stock market do all this. Maybe it's somebody who's retired and say, eh, I need better growth on my money than 6% in this mutual fund. Maybe it's somebody who got a fat bonus at work and didn't know what to do with it. Maybe it's somebody who got T-boned by a city bus and they got a nice payment and they're like, man, I don't know what to do with this, but I need to put my money someplace where it'll grow. So we put together like-minded individuals and we say, hey, this is this nice 100 unit we got. This is how we're going to make money off this 100 unit. Right now, this 100 unit is at 80% occupancy. The 20 units that are not occupied, we're going to renovate those. We're going to upgrade those a little bit. New carpet, new paint, new countertops, new hardware, new faucets, new light bulbs, new ceiling fans. So the other units that rent to $700, these are now renting at $900. That's one way we're going to bring up profit. Another way, there's a storage facility on this apartment complex. We don't need storage. Y'all can find your own storage. What we're going to do is we're going to call up a general contractor to run two power lines that are high voltage, two water lines, and two drain lines. We're now going to turn this storage building into a 16 washer, 16 dryer on-site laundry facility. And if you don't know, laundry facilities print money. That's another way we're going to bump up profits. Also, we are going to slightly but surely bump up rents every single year because you know why? Inflation, cost of living is going up. So those units might be at $700 today, but next year they're going to be $725, so on and so forth. And maybe our apartment complex sits on a hill in the highest portion of town. Hmm, who could take advantage of our geography? A cell phone company we are gonna stick a cell phone tower on top of our building or in the empty corner of our parking lot. And we're gonna let Verizon and T-Mobile and Sprint pay us $10,000 a year to use our cell phone tower. So if you've never been involved in that aspect of the business, you don't know that there are so many different ways that you can monetize that. And so we're gonna tell you that look, there's, there's risk in this because you know tornado could come and knock that building down tomorrow or we could have the tenants from heck, but we're gonna take this investment and we're gonna turn it around and you're gonna see a 12% return on your cash. Cool, that's way better than the stock market. I'll park my 50 grand there for sure. But again, because me and Mr. Jefferson are doing all the heavy leg work, we're getting 20% of that deal, even though our initial investment wasn't as much. So after we change the occupancy from 80% to 97%, and we've slowly but surely moved people around and we've renovated 80 of the 100 units because we moved some people from the old units into the new units and bumped up their rent, and renovated the old units. And we put in a laundry facility and we put in a cell phone tower and we did some other things like maybe there was an on-site office that had a whole lounge in there that we didn't need. 
we're going to turn that lounge into another unit. Now there's 101 units. So after we've done all these changes, we're going to say this apartment complex isn't worth $2 million anymore. If you look at the cap rate and you look at our, look at our net operating income, now this apartment complex is worth $3.8 million. So what are we going to do? We're going to go and refinance. We're going to pull equity out. And all of our investors, they're getting a nice little chunk of money back. So you might get $37,000 of your $50,000 initial investment back to you in a lump sum, and you're still getting a quarterly dividend. And that's a really brief introduction on how multifamily investing works. But here's the thing. It's not just multifamily investing. Um, trailer parks, they work the exact same way. The exact wow. same way. What can we do to bump up the revenue? Well, this place is out in the country. They got dirt roads. Okay, cool. Let's pave these roads or let's put down a gravel bed. Now we can charge more on this section of the park because it's paved. Let's throw in some amenities. Let's throw in a laundry facility. Let's throw in a, uh, a clubhouse that people can rent out for gatherings. It's the same concept. But it's usually not just one rich joker like Mr. Jefferson buying an apartment building. It's people <laughs> like he and I that are getting creative, like, how can we put together our meager resources to go out and get something big? Then how can we turn that big thing into a bigger thing and get our money out the deal? Gotcha. So the development that you guys uh, have, have acquired, mm -hmm. walk me, you got to the point where you had uh, put in 125 and the bank financed the other 50%. Yes. So okay. I'm sorry, go ahead. So that was, was that the acquisition of the land or was that the acquisition of the land and starting something on the project? That was the acquisition of the loan. Okay. So, unbeknownst to us, uh, you don't know what you don't know. There right. are several steps to a development. So uh, one of the first things you have to do, and a lot of people do this before they even close on the property. You might have a period of due diligence for 30 to 90 days where you can kick the tires on that back. Um, you have to get a phase one environmental. What's a phase one environmental? Most people have never heard of it you go out and you pay a specialized company who will go out and do a survey of the property. They'll even take soil borings in sometimes to make sure there are no environmental challenges on your land. Who's to say that 60 years ago, there was a gas station here that we didn't know about and they had underground storage tanks that have been leaking fuel that they just abandoned in place. We didn't know that. That thing's been leaking diesel fuel for the last 50 years. That's an environmental nightmare. Before we can build homes there, we gotta clean that up. Or what happens if there was a, a factory there back in the 1980s that used heavy metal, not 1980s, but 18, 1910s or whatever. That factory since been knocked down and grass has grown up, but they had arsenic and heavy metals there. Well, that's an environmental disaster. We can't build them all there. We can't build an apartment complex there. So. Your, in, your phase one environmental will do an inspection of the property to go out, they'll take soil borings to test the soil, make sure none's crazy there. They'll also go back through property records to see who's owned it and what businesses operated there in the past. Once you get a clean bill of health on your phase one, then people will start looking at you and go, okay, now you, you, you might have something now that we make sure there's not a toxic waste dump that you're trying to build on. Because if that's the case, remediation is very, very expensive to have to haul off dirt and have it incinerated and bring in clean dirt. No one has time for that. That can make your project unfeasible from the get-go. So step one, phase one environmental. Step two, and this is one thing that most people don't do, you need to talk to your local stakeholders. And by stakeholders, I mean whoever if you're in a city that has council members or, or wardmen or whatever it's called in your city or county, whoever the elected officials are, it's a very good idea to go and speak to that gentleman or that lady and say, hi, my name is Mr. Jefferson. I'm interested in buying this parcel. 
and this is what I would like to do with this land that's in your district. What are your thoughts? What are you looking for in that area? This is what I'd like to do. I'd like to do some workforce housing. I'm not looking to do public housing. I don't want to stick a whole bunch of apartments in there. I want to do some houses that an educator, a policeman, uh, a firefighter, uh, a nurse, a single parent can afford that people can show pride and ownership in and that's not priced out of the market. How does that sound to you, Mr. or Mrs. Council person? Hopefully they'll buy in and say, yeah, yeah, that's cool. I like that. What you gonna do? But on the flip side, before you close on that deal, you need to ensure that they don't have other inclination for that property. Maybe they wanted that property for parkland. Maybe they wanted that property to build a new middle school. So if you're buying a property and you're not making sure that the stakeholders are at least aware, if not on board, you could be setting yourself up for trouble because they can make life very unpleasant for you. So after you've talked to your, you got your phase one environmental, you've talked to your stakeholders, you need to spend some time down at your planning and zoning department or your permit department or whatever other department may be called in your jurisdiction. Because there are certain things that you need to research. For instance, we wanted to put 74 townhouses on this parcel, right? Okay, I happen to know this because I have an engineering background and I've built millions of dollars of facilities. I know that there's a certain capacity of your utilities. You have to have a certain size water line to be able to service that. If there's a six inch water main and you're trying to feed 74 houses off a six inch water main, you are SOL. So what's going to happen if you told to the city and say, hey, I want to build 74 townhouses. The city's going to say, oh, that's cool. Yeah, you need to fill out this permit right here to increase the size of your water line and that bills on you. Whoa, whoa, what, what, what? I, I don't have money to tear up the city streets and put in a 12 inch water main. Well, we're not going to approve it unless you do. You don't have enough water service. Okay. Not only do you need water, you need sewer. When people turn on their faucet, that water goes someplace, right? Right. There's sewage capacity there. Do they have a six inch sewer main? Okay. Is that six inch sewer main 80 years old? And is it made out of clay or made out of wood? Like you might find in some older cities on the East coast. If you're in Philadelphia, you might have a clay sewer pipe that's 80 years old and crumbling apart. They're not going to let you tap into that old sewer line. They're going to be like, no, nah, you need to replace all this. And you need to bump up the size from an 8 inch sewer main to a 12 inch sewer main. Can you afford that? Probably not. So before you lock down any hard earned money on this development, you need to do a little bit of research to find out, is it even feasible? So we did that. I went down to planning and zoning and I found out that there was a 12, a 12 inch water main running directly adjacent to our property. And there was also an eight inch sewer line that had just been replaced. It had a stub up on either side of our property. So cool, we could tap in the water, we could tap in the sewer. Now, mind you, I said tap in because this is a 12 inch water main. This is what it looks like. It's just okay. a tube, right? When you're building a house, your house might have a two inch water line, right? Your two right. inch water line is gonna plug into this. Right. The problem is you don't own this. The city or the county owns this. So in order to tap this into that, you have to apply for permission. You have to fill out a permit. Permits cost money. Also, you have to tap into that, which means literally you're shutting off the water here in order to bore a hole into this and insert your pipe into that. That also costs money. And you're also shutting down the 12 inch water main, which means you might be knocking out water to the school, to a hospital. They may not let you do that when you want to do that. So those are all things that have to be researched because if that 12 inch water main feeds a hospital system, they're gonna say, Nah, I don't think your project is important enough to disrupt the hospital. You might need to get water from over here six blocks away 
which can cost you another $80,000. Okay, those are questions you need to ask. How would you know to ask that? You probably wouldn't. Great because question. You're not a developer. <laughs> <laughs> You've never done this before. So that's why I say you need to spend some time down at planning and zoning or permits and construction, whatever the department is called. And when you go down there, you go down there with your hat in your hand and a couple dozen donuts and a big old jug of coffee from Starbucks. And you say, hey, I brought these to you as a, as a peace offering. Can you please help me out? I've never done this before. This is my idea. Can you tell me if my idea was, is feasible, if it works? Take a look at your plans. And they'll literally punch holes in it. Can't do this. Can't do that. Can't do this. Here's why. Okay, great. And when I say plans, your plan can literally be a sketch on a piece of paper because that's what we initially had. We had some graph paper that I took a ruler and we sketched. And we said, this is the general concept. Can this work? Yeah, sure. You're going to have an issue here, 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 and here. Okay, great. I'm glad I found this out before I spent a whole bunch of money. Because one of the things that we had happened to us because of site challenges and what we learned at planning and zoning, our plan went from 74 units to 69 units. We lost five houses. That's over a million dollars in real estate we just lost. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thankfully for us, we were able to acquire the parcel at a low enough price where 69 units still worked for us, still very profitable. So cool, we moved forward. So from my time in construction, I happen to have a little bit of experience with this. 30% of a cost of a construction, of a building, of a home, is things that you cannot see. It's under the dirt, the unsexy stuff. So if you have a $10 million development, $3,333,000 is things like water lines, sewer lines, paving, streets, things that nobody cares about. When you buy in a house, you care about 10 foot ceilings, marble countertops, glass backsplash. You, no one cares about your water line. You're never gonna see it most times. But that's the money that you have to spend upfront before you can build a single house. So we're trying to build 69 of them, right? right. How are we gonna get this money to finance this stuff under the dirt, the water, the sewer, the paving. You know how much it costs to pave? A lot. A lot. A lot. Yeah. Just even paving sidewalks cost a crazy amount of money. Paving curbs, things you don't care about till it scrapes up your rim. Those things are expensive. <laughs> till your wife scrapes up your rims. <laughs> right, right. So the question is, how do we get that money? So again, remember we said we talked to our stakeholders? Right. We literally went and sat down and met with our local council member. We, we called him, we emailed him, we bugged the hell out of him until we got a face-to-face -face meeting. Me and my partner, we put on our suit, we took our shiny presentation boulders up there, presentation folders up there. We <laughs> talked to him, we said, Mr. So-and-so, this is what we want to do. He was like, okay, I like it. You know what he did? He called up the head of housing development for the city of Dallas. He said, hey, come on down to my office. I need you to meet this young man and this young lady. He's like, oh, we in there. We made it. No, we didn't. We just got a conversation. Right. But it was a stepping stone where we were able to talk to this gentleman and present him with our plan. And one of the first questions anyone will ask you, do you have site control? Do you own the dirt? Because a lot of people have grand plans for a piece of property that they don't own. And believe me, I'm not talking about anybody who's listening. This is just the way it is. They're going to want to know, do you have site control? Do you either own it or is it pending and under contract? Because if you can't say any of those two, they're not going to take you serious. Wow. So our thing was we need to have a budget for what this stuff under the dirt costs. Now, me, I'm fortunate enough where I come from that background, I was able to pull some old resources, pencil whip that thing, and I realized the number was about $2.3 million. But let's say you don't come from a construction background. You've just got a hustler's mentality or you're a business person. 
how do you find that information? How do you find out what this costs? Well, you're going to have to talk to a subcontractor or a general contractor who does that for a living. So you can either call up your local, it wouldn't be your local plumber. It's not like rotor router. It would have to be a commercial plumbing company who would run your water and your sewer line. They're, they're called utility companies. You'd call utility. up your, your public utility construction company, whoever they are. Maybe it's Jefferson Utilities. You call them up and you say, hey, this is what I want to do. Can you give me an estimate? Being that you're not a big time developer, they're going to do it for free, but they're going to do it at their leisure. They might put an intern on it and they might get it back to you in three weeks. That's cool. It didn't cost you anything. Maybe you can call up um, a general contractor. You've got a dirt guy and a concrete guy and all that. They can look at it. They'll pencil whip it for you. One thing you need to keep in mind, they also have their markup in there. Everybody will have a markup in there. And there's nothing wrong with that because they have to be in business to make profit, right? Right. So then when you have your budget, you know what you need to get started. So our number was $2.3 million. That's a lot of money to raise. If I want to go back to my friends, my colleagues, and my coworkers, they're going to be like, oh, yeah, I put $2.3 million in to say I own an apartment building because that's sexy, and I'm getting money off that thing every quarter. But $2.3 million to put in some water lines and some sewer lines and to pave some streets, and you might not build a house and sell it for another two years? I don't know. That's not sexy. It's not sexy at all. So let me ask you a question before we get past that. It's a long-term investment is what you said, right? And when you're purchasing the property and you're getting the numbers for the utilities and the infrastructure, are you pricing in your mind? Or are you trying to see the price of the lot as it's comparable to that moment? Or are you projecting what it could be three years down the line. So the way we were looking at it, we specifically wanted to build. So we were projecting for build costs for homes. This is what we need to do. And again, our inkling was, we're not gonna build luxury homes. At the time in our market, we wanted the homes to start at 200 grand and maybe go up to 265 for the, the bigger homes. That was three and a half years ago. The way our market is now, those homes that would have started at 195 back then were started 260 today, maybe more. So we didn't even have the, the inflation factor in. We couldn't see that. But we were thinking if it costs $2.3 million for the, in, for the infrastructure, and we know the build cost for each individual home, so let's just say $85. Five dollars a square foot because we're not building super luxurious you know we're building starter homes and you know the smallest home is going to be 1400 square feet you can crunch the numbers on that and you can factor in your, your build costs how much that'll cost when you turn around and sell it so when we pencil whip the whole project all the way out after we sold it the potential profit that we were looking at was about 1.1 million dollars each for my partner and i so for us that's an investment. And that's just the cost. That's the profit from turning the property around because we're both residential realtors. We were going to list the properties as well. So we were really going to double dip. Cool. Uh, but um, so we, we, we pencil whipped it all the way out from acquisition costs to this is what it'll cost when we close paying title policy and everything else. But before we get there, we to get past that $2.3 million hurdle, right? Okay. Could we have raised that? Yeah, but it would have been a hard raise because people would say, man, that's pretty darn risky. I'm going to need a high interest rate for that. You know, if I'm putting my money into an apartment complex, yeah, I'm cool making 9 10 12% return. That's great. But for me to put my money into some dirt, to some stuff I can't even see, Nah, I'm going to need 20% return. Those interest rates eat into your profit real quick. So we're like, okay, we can't do that. So remember, we were trying to find something that the stakeholders would buy into. So we took our happy tail right on back to the city, met with our council member, 
met with the head of housing and we said, um, hey, Mr. Council member, hey, Mr. Head of Housing, uh, we need $2.3 million for this project. We in there all sheepish and bashful, you know, about to beg. They looked at it and was like, all right, didn't bat an eyelash. We were like, what, what, really, that's it? They were like, yeah, well, you have to apply for it, but yeah, that's cool. We're like, that's cool, y'all just gonna give us 2.3 million? Yeah, kind of, sure. Because one, the city needs housing. Right. Two, they want to increase that tax base. These homeowners are paying property taxes. They're going to get their money back. Plus, whatever, we were literally probably going to pay $200,000 in permits and fees. They're going to get their money back out of it. So, but they were like, you have to apply for the money via a NOFA. What's a NOFA? A NOFA is a notice of funding availability. It's a fancy way of saying RFP, request for proposal. Every now and then, the city, the county, the state, they will have a pot of money from HUD, Housing and Urban Development, that they have to spend. It's a use it or lose it situation. The city of Dallas gets about 22 to $24 million every single year they have to use. Maybe they'll use it on repaving streets, Maybe they'll use it on replacing water lines and sewer lines to get rid of old water, to get rid of old lead lines or old clay sewer pipes. Maybe they'll use it for affordable housing development. We're like, cool. We don't even want the full 22. Just go ahead and kick us 2.3. We'll be straight. And they're like, okay, well, here's your 50-page application to fill out. You jump through these hoops and we'll give you $2.3 million. So we did that. We filled out the 50 page application and we jumped through the hoops. And when I tell you we submitted a packet that was literally six inches thick, it was a six inch binder filled to the brim with everything you can think of. Oh, and we had to submit 10 hard copies and 10 electronic copies. So we spent about two grand at the print shop on that alone. So. <laughs> Um, that's what they don't tell you about being a developer. There's a whole lot of money you're going to spend up front that they don't tell you about. But we went through the NOFA process and there was like a 50 point process or whatever. When I tell you we missed the cutoff by two points, we literally missed the cutoff by two points. We were two points away from getting $2.3 million. Wow. So what were two points? And why did we miss it? All right. Well, to be frank, we're small time developers. It's two people in our spouses. We had already spent a gang of money, you know, 50 grand each just to get the dirt, a couple of grand for a survey, a couple of grand for an environmental inspection, a couple of grand for a marketing report, $2,500 at the print shop. This cost adds up real quick, right? Next thing you know, we're $65,000, $70,000 into this. So one of the things that they wanted to see from us, they wanted to see audited financials. So what did audited financials? Because we bought the property in the LLC that we had created just for this development. The LLC had only been around 12 months, give or take. So it didn't have a long track record. So audited financials means you hire a CPA firm to go through your finances with a fine tooth comb and give us a report. Then, you hire a second CPA firm to audit that first CPA firm to make sure you aren't cooking your books. And then you submit that to us. So a big developer, somebody like, I don't know, uh, I can't, uh, Matthews. Matthews is a big developer here in Dallas. They build skyscrapers. They already have audited financials every single year because they have their own accounting firm and they, Cool, that's just the cost of doing business for them. For us, audited financials would have been another $12,000. And we're like, whoa, mm. how about we just give you our tax return? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so our, our, our hope was that, hey, we wrote a very nice letter explaining it. We had our CPAs write a very nice letter explaining it with their CPA license number. And we said, hey, if we get past this first stage of the application, we will definitely provide you with audited financials. That was step one. The other thing is because we're getting public money from HUD, our entire application package is subject 
to a FOIA request. What's a FOIA? The FOIA is Freedom of Information Act. So Mr. Jefferson could be enterprising and be like, huh, I see this company just got $2.3 million from Dallas County. I want to know what that $2.3 million is, and I want to know what this company is. So anybody could request FOIA, and not only would they get our company docs, they could get my home address. They could get my tax return out of my social security number on it. They could see my LLCs. They could see my bank statements that I had to submit with proof of financing. They could see every investment property that I own. So we were like, huh, we're willing to do that, but we're not willing to do that at this initial stage. If we get past the first round, sure, we're in the game, all cards on the table, cards up. You can see all our trump cards, all our spades. But we were like, can't really do that. Because any Joe Blow can see where I lay my head at night. You know, a big development company like Matthews, they have a corporate headquarters. They're they're not putting down their home address. My corporate headquarters is my house. So we were like, ah, we're not comfortable doing that at this moment. So when they sent us back our letter saying thanks, but no thanks, those were the two points that we missed out on. Understandably hurt and disappointed. So we reached out. So they have like a feedback process. So during our feedback process, we, we laid into them, real professional like, like, hey, you say you want affordable developing, affordable housing. You say you want more developers. Well, hey, we're a mom and pop developer. We tried to do A, B, and C. Look at what, where you stopped us. So we actually got a meeting with the vice chair of housing development. And we told them, and they were like, you know what? You're absolutely right. We'll take that into advisement. We were like, hey, cool. We made some progress. So fast forward six months later, another NOFA came out. We were like, yes. In that NOFA, they had made every single request that we had made, they, they had changed it. So we were like, yeah, this is perfect. This is a slam dunk for us. But remember, HUD only gives $22 million a year. They had spent a nice chunk of the money on the first NOFA. So in the second NOFA, they didn't have any money left in our district for housing. So they were like, oh yeah, if you were three miles to the east, We'll give you $2.3 million, but we've already spent our money in District 7 for the year. Okay. So we had to wait till the next year. So in between that time, uh, my first child was born and my wife and I got pregnant with our second child. So our, our focus changed. We also bought a franchise. We, we got money going elsewhere. So our focus changed. So at the time, we still got dirt. You know, we're paying $1,000 a year to get it mowed. We're paying about $8,000 in property taxes a year. We're also covering the debt service on that, on that loan, which is about $1,400 a month, split between the two of us, 700 bucks a month. It's not a deal breaker, but you're legitimately burning $8,400 a year on mortgage, plus another 8,000 on taxes, plus another thousand on mowing. That's $17,000 a year going down the drain. Not down the drain, because you're paying off your mortgage, but still. So we got back around to year two. And if you're not in Dallas, you may not be familiar with some of our local politics. Dallas City Hall has some challenges. Um, in the past three years, there have been two city council members who have gone to jail for accepting bribes from housing developers. So it has become very, very difficult for someone who is not established like we aren't, or who doesn't have a squeaky clean record to get money from the city of Dallas. Understandably so, council members are CYA. So even stranger tidbit, about three months ago, we met with a developer and you can Google this, uh, we won't get in trouble for this. The gentleman's name is Rue Hamilton. We had a conversation with Mr. Hamilton. Mr. Hamilton says, hey, I like your project. We can either partner or I can buy it off you directly. We were like, okay, cool. We talked about it. So we tossed around a price. We came around to a price that we liked. Then Mr. Hamilton kind of went ghost on us for about two weeks. We were like, huh, 
wonder what happened to Mr. Hamilton, where if you Google Rue Hamilton, you will see that gentleman just got convicted of federal bribery charges. He had bribed a city council member to get three of his housing developments, some HUD financing. So we were like, oh my God, we oof. get out some sanitizer, get our hands clean. We, we, we almost got dirty. Now, mind you, we weren't doing anything dirty, but unfortunately that culture has been very pervasive, which is why it's so hard to get affordable housing because, and I won't piss off anybody by telling the truth. In the past, some of the leadership has been so corrupt. It's not the case nowadays, but people are understandably gun shy. So we decided, we bought our parcel at such an affordable price and land values are rising so greatly. Let's just wipe our hands of the development. And let's turn around and sell it. So we had two options. The first one is we wanted to stick with our original goal of work fate, uh, workforce marketplace housing. So we contacted um, Habitat for Humanity, who actually builds entire subdivisions here in Dallas. And they were like, hey, we love the concept. We just got to get our coins together. And what we'll do is we'll build these houses. We'll turn around and we'll let you sell them because we're all about affordable housing. We were like, okay, we'll sell it. We'll definitely get our money back and make a nice chunk of money and probably make another six figures each selling these houses. It's not ideal, but it's definitely a win-win. We get paid, our investors get paid, no harm, no foul. So we negotiated back and forth with Habitat for Humanity for literally about 13 months. And then uh, Mr. Jefferson knows this, about two weeks ago, another developer came along and said, hey, I like it, I wanna buy it. And that gentleman literally purchased it off of us for triple our initial investment. And we closed about, we closed on the, uh, Close on the 15th, I believe. Something like that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So we tripled our money, essentially. So I got a ton of questions. <laughs> got a ton of questions, man. So knowing now what you didn't know then, right? what would be your plan of action in terms of funding the infrastructure if you knew that you might have got slighted because you were a new development through the nose? So a couple of things. Knowing what I know now, I would have had a longer due diligence period. Okay. I would have made my due diligence period 90 or 120 days. And yes, I would have been willing to put up five grand maybe even 10 grand that was non-refundable because that would have given me plenty of opportunities to shop my project around before I was 150 grand in. I can lose 10 grand. Yeah, I'll be salty for a couple of days, but I'll be all right. Putting 150 grand at risk, that's a whole nother ball game. So we did have opportunities outside of the city. We had commercial lenders like brick and mortar banks who said, yeah, I'll finance it but we would have been beholden to them. They would have been the one calling the shots. Well, I think you need to make your houses this size. I think you need to name your streets this because that's more appeasing. We were going to name the streets after ourselves because hey, it's our development. Right. So we would have had more time to shop around with the city. And we would have had more time to shop around with the bank. We literally took 15 different lenders out to lunch or had uh, meetings with them. And we talked to people, nonprofits, churches, you name it. That would have given us more time to shop around and more time to have partners in place that shared our same value. Because we weren't being greedy. Our goal was let's make a development for people like my parents, essentially. My parents were the first people in their houses who were in their families, both sides, to ever buy a home. My, my mom's family had always been renters. My dad's family had always been renters. So the American dream for them was buying a three bedroom, two bathroom house to raise their kids in. That's it. 
you know, we weren't trying to build three story glass and stone fancy townhouses that are luxurious. We wanted people who look like us to have an opportunity. So we would have been able to find partners who shared our vision. There's still profit in that, but maybe it would have been working with somebody like Habitat from the get go that we can stomach being in business with them because we share the same vision versus a bank who's only worried about the bottom line. And there's nothing wrong with being worried about the bottom line, but we were very specific about what we wanted to do in this community. We didn't want gentrification to drive out people who look like you and I. We wanted you and I to have an opportunity. So I would have had a longer due diligence period so that I could have shopped around more and found more willing partners and partners who were willing to see our vision. So how long was your due diligence period? It was 30 days. And we used that 30 days just to go get the financing to purchase it. But we would have liked to have had 90 to 120 days to not only get the financing to purchase it, but to get the financing lined up to develop it. Because in most major cities, development's a slow process. If you buy that land, it's going to be at least 12 months before you can put a shovel in the ground. So we would have liked three to four months up front before we even buy to start that process. To get a so, head start. I'm sorry. So all of that, the feasibility, the, the donuts, the coffee, the lunches, the 50-page application, the six-inch binder, all of that happened in 30 days? Yes. There were some wow. very long nights. So there were some nights my partner and I were at the office until 11 p.m. Uh, we actually share an office space. So we'd be back to back in our chairs, reading briefs to each other. Uh, she'd be reading memos out loud, out loud, asking me to critique. So we had some very long nights. We we meet up Saturdays and Sundays. Uh, we took time away from our personal business and from our families to make it work. We still made it work. We right. are very proud and Let's be clear, like just to be open and honest, we didn't get three times our return on investment. We got three times the sales price. So our return on investment was like a five time return on investment. Right. So it, it worked out well for us, but it, we didn't earn $1.1 million each, but we earned a pretty penny. So what the first question is, I know it's in the city limits of Dallas, right? However, was there any, have you learned of any way the county had funds to contribute? Because the county benefits as well with county taxes, correct? They do, they absolutely do. So we did have those conversations and it might work different from city to city or state to state. But in our particular state, the county of Texas is, eh, that's in Dallas County. You go talk to them. We're not really concerned about what goes on. I'm sorry, that's in da Dallas City. We're not really concerned about what goes on. That's, man, that's, that's minuscule to us because the city of Dallas is about 354 square miles. It's a big city. Dallas County is probably four times the size of that. So that's not even a drop in a drop in the bucket to them. They can care about you. Gotcha. And in terms of, let's say there was no developer, no habitat who came through and offered you to buy out the development, what would have been another strategy you guys had? So we've been carrying the property for about, uh, three and a half years and we'd actually refinanced once since then if we had really dug down we could have just said ah screw it we could have paid it off in two years and then we could have just held it because here's the thing about dirt they're not making any more of it it's within the city limits uh geographically we were in a prime area we are one mile from interstate 35 and if you're not from our area, Interstate 35 is the major north-south interstate. It runs right through the city, right through the heart of downtown Dallas. And it runs directly from the Mexican border to the Canadian border. I mean, 
hundreds of thousands of cars every single week. We were one mile from Interstate 35. We were also one mile from Interstate 20, which is an interstate which runs east-west through the southern suburbs and southern Dallas. Not nearly as much traffic as I-35, but it runs all the way from West Texas to Atlanta. So plenty of traffic on I-20. Also, we were a six minute drive from the city of Dallas's newest university, the University of North Texas, Dallas, UNTD. And we were seven minute drive from a major redevelopment mall project that the city has sunk $22 million into. Uh, you can Google it, it's Redbird Mall. So we knew we were in a prime location. So we figured we really wanted to develop it. And if we couldn't develop it, we really wanted to sell it. And we knew we could sell it. But we figured even if we couldn't develop it and we couldn't sell it, we could wait them out. Because gentrification is coming. And when you've got that much vehicular traffic and you're in between a major mall redevelopment, which is building apartments and building hotels adjacent to it, and a major, not a major, but a new university that's building dormitories and adding to it, and you're within five minutes of the um, light rail line for, for public transportation, it's just a matter of time. So we prefer not to hold it another three, four years, but if we had really doubled down, we could have paid it off in three, four years and just been paying eight, nine grand a year in taxes and a thousand dollars in mowing. Wow. So that's so that's that's one thing that I hear people talk about with with their the holding cost. You know, the 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 fact of holding it over a course of you know four, five, six, ten years, like that adds up. So it's like the chicken or the egg. Do you get your money now or do you try to wait and get it at the end? Which you know, which one do you do? Right. Um, so I guess that that's, that being said, at that point, if you had to hold it for three or four more years, who would have put that bill? Would it have been you and your partner or would it have been the, the, the investors in you and your partner? So, we, so there's two ways we could have done it. My partner and I, we could have paid it off. We really didn't want to. I mean, I, the better things I'd rather do with my money. I'd rather put them where they can grow, you know. But my partner and I could have paid it off in about another three or four years. Because remember, the initial debt service was only 150 grand. Right. And it's not a little bit of money, but, you know, two working adults, we could have knocked it out. You know what I'm saying? Right. We could have knocked it out. Or we could have opened up a second round of investment. We could have went out to additional friends and family and say, hey, you have an opportunity to buy into this investment. We could have used it that way to pay it off. But one of the things that we learned after the fact that I would definitely do next time, you specifically talked about holding costs. Here in, ta here in Texas, taxes can eat you alive. We have high property taxes because we have no state income tax. So they kind of offset. <clears throat> so one of the things that you'll notice Sometimes you'll see out in the suburbs, there's a development, like there's, there's a Walmart and a Home Depot and a Chick-fil-A and a CVS, all in the same shopping plaza, right? Right. Next, because there's new development, next to that development, there'll be like a grass field. And there might be some cows in that grass field. There might be a couple bales of hay in that grass field. I will guarantee you this, nine times out of 10, the developer who, who bought the parcel, they put the Home Depot and the Target and the, all that other stuff on it, they own the parcel next to them that's farmland. So why do they keep it as farmland? Or pretend to keep it as farmland? Because there's something called an ag exemption. That was short for agricultural exemption. You get taxed a fraction of the cost on your land if it's agricultural. So you might not really be farming anything. You might pay some dudes with a tractor to come in and cut your grass and stick three bales of hay on your property. <laughs> then you can say, hey, it's agriculture. I got hay. Or you might find a farmer who says, hey, man, I got 12 cows. 
Can I put my cows on your land? Yeah, sure. Pay me a hundred bucks a month. I'll let you put your cows on my land. Now it's agricultural. I'm letting your cows take care of my yard maintenance for me. I don't have to pay to get it mowed because you put up a barbed wire fence for me. And you've got cows and goats and horses that are eating my grass. Now it's farmland, technically, even though I own it and I'm not farming jack, but I'm getting paid. I'm getting taxed literally 7% of what I was getting taxed before. So instead of carrying an $8,000 a year tax bill, my tax bill might have been like, you know, seven fifty dollars a year. That makes holding that property much, much easier. Those are some of the tricks of the trade. Wow. So the in terms of splitting with your investors, mm -hmm. um, if do you mind going into numbers? It doesn't have to be exact, but just to oh. kind of get an idea of how it was split. Not at all. Not at all. So okay. let's just say um, I don't have a Series 7 license, so don't come and get me, SEC. I cannot <laughs> sell securities. No <laughs> one can sell securities or unless you want to get in trouble with the feds, unless you have a Series 7 license. So we didn't sell shares. We sold units, all right? So we could say, hey, Mr. Jefferson, you want to invest with us? You can buy a unit. Your unit is worth five grand, right? One unit is equal 1%. So maybe you put in 25 grand and you own five units. Five units is 5% of the, pro of the project, right? Of course, remember when we talked about when me and Mr. Jefferson bought our apartment building? We own 20% outright. Well, me and my partner own 61% outright. Because, you know, we're putting a significant amount of risk in this and we show as hell put a hell of a lot of work in it. Right. Even though our cash investment was less than 61% of what we raised, we took 61% ownership, which means there was 39% uh, of investment units out there. So when we sold our project, when we got our significant lump sum, Instead of worrying about compound interest, we can eat you up over three and a half years. We just gave people their percentage based upon the number of units that they owned. So if you initially invested 25 units, you got 25% of the lump sum after our expenses got reimbursed. So mm. we got reimbursed for the initial 25 grand my partner and I both put up. We got reimbursed for the mowing. We got reimbursed for the taxes. We got reimbursed for the development costs, like our printing, our phase one environmental, our marketing study. We got reimbursed for the $18,000 in carrying costs from our monthly payments. So even after we got our reimbursement, we split the pot. So after we got reimbursed, you know, cause we did put it up and you no, know, we didn't charge them any interest. That was money out of pocket. We got reimbursed for all of our costs. Then we split the pot. My partner and I, we took our 61% and everybody else, they got their shares. Now, because we bought it low enough and we sold it high enough, everybody got about a 27% a return on their investment. Wow. So no one was complaining at the end of the day. So they got their money back plus 27%. 27% return on investment is way better than what you're going to find in the stock market. It's unheard of, man. And, and, and most, most investment vehicles. Yeah. So we were gracious with that because we knew that people took a risk on us. And to be clear, there were some people that we came to initially, family and friends who were like, nah, too risky or nah, I don't have faith in y'all. Y'all are just kids. Just kids, you know, we're in our 40s, but, you know, <laughs> just kids. So uh, the people who invested in us, we rewarded them handsomely. Sure, we got rewarded more handsomely, but everybody turned up with a very nice cashier's check at the end of the day. And several of them have already called us and be like, so when are we going to do it again? And we're right. Like, whoa, whoa. Let us breathe a little minute here. Let us let, let, let us breathe. Yeah. So in the land, the, as, 
did you sell it to them this in the same position in the um development stage as you received it yep we haven't done anything but mold along wow because I was wondering if you guys had had it uh, plotted out or anything, but in the story, it didn't sound like it sounded like you were doing the feasibility. You had the holding costs. You were doing your due diligence, looking at your options to get it to the development stage. And then when the NOFA didn't come through the first or the second time, you kind of start shopping it around to to see who would be in, in, interested in investing you know, or purchasing it from you. So we did want to be good neighbors because, you know, it's a small development world. You never know if you're going to bump into this buyer or seller again in the future. So when we sold it to them, we handed over all the legwork we had done. We gave them the survey. We gave them the phase one environmental. We had actually talked to it and partnered with an engineering firm. And we had a preliminary plat. We just had to have submitted to the city. However, the reason we didn't submit it to the city, to the city, <laughs> the total cost involved for running that preliminary plat would have been about 25 grand. Wow. Yeah. Now, could we have done it? Sure, we could have done it. And maybe if we had spent that 25 grand, maybe the city or banks would have looked at us more favorably if we were already preliminary platted. Like we had several developers told me, hey, if you get it to preliminary plat, we'll buy it off you tomorrow. We're like, well, yeah, why are you making us do the work and spend an additional 25 grand? We know what we have. We know it's valuable just because of the location and the zone. So, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, man. No, I was going to say, so we were good neighbors and we handed all that over as a packet and said, good luck and God bless. Gotcha. So in hindsight, do you think that if you guys had spent the 12 grand on the audited taxes that you would have got the NOFA? Because those were the other two points, right? Though we may have received the NOFA. But again, um, City Hall in Dallas is a little shaky right now. So again, in the past three or four years, two of the 13 council members have been indicted and convicted for bribery directly related to housing development. So we were dealing with uncharted waters. And since then, two more developers have caught federal bribery conviction. So there, who, what's, who's to say that we could have spent the 12 grand, we could have been awarded the NOFA, and then they could have said, ah, we're going to wait. We're going to stall you out. We're not going to give it to you this quarter. We're going to give it to you first quarter of 2021. Oh, we're going to give it to you first quarter of 2022. We're playing by their rules. It's their money, they can give it to us if and when they see fit. And we have heard of people who have been who have been awarded things from the city in the city either didn't deliver or delivered on their own sweet time. You know, working with the city, you on could literally be 18 to 36 months before we saw a penny of that money. And who's to say how our personal situations or how the economy could have changed by then. Right. So how much legwork do you think the current developer has before they can start building on that land? So I happen to know the current developer. And strangely enough, to the north of our parcel, there is a church, decent sized church. On the direct other side of that church is a parcel that the current owner owns considerably smaller, it's three acres, it's same zone. <clears throat> He's owned that parcel for three or four years longer than we owned our parcel. He happens to also be independently wealthy. So he can buy it and sit on it and wait until the issues that the city gets worked out. Or he, he might be wealthy enough where he doesn't need the city at all. He might decide, hey, I'm going to build some luxury stuff right here. I'm just going to wait five years until gentrification comes up. <clears throat> so we had a specific purpose in mind, but after not coming to a deal with other people who were like-minded, we said, hey, this is an investment and it's time we get a return on our investment. So I happen to know that gentleman builds luxury homes. You know, he builds six, 7,000 square foot homes. So he's not going to build those there. 
but he could easily build luxury townhomes there and sell them for a pretty penny. And that might be what he wants to do. He might sit on it 10 more years. He's, he's got, he's got time on it. All right. So in knowing what you and your partner and your team's goal was uh, compared to what you think he'll build there, do you feel like, and I'm not, I don't mean anything. You feel like you kind of sold your dream because a little bit, it's not what you intended for that area. Cause from the, from the conversation, it sounds like you and your team were heavily invested in making a change in that area, but you kind of went for the bag. We absolutely were. And we wanted that. Unfortunately, in order for us to pursue that dream at that price point, we would have had to have had help from the city. Okay. We did talk to commercial bank lenders like brick and mortar banks who said, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll lend you the money for development, but it'll come at this cost. So if we had went that route, we wouldn't have been able to build at that price point. We would have been forced to go up market. So the city of Dallas has housing shortage, depending upon what source you look at, they need between 16,000 and 21,000 affordable housing units in the next five years. They're not on pace to reach that. We were attempting to help them out, but by no fault of their own because of past messes that the new administration is forced to clean up, they weren't able to make it happen for us. So we knew from the get-go, in order to happen at this price point, we would need government assistance, and we weren't able to receive that. So even still, after we didn't get the first or the second NOFA, we still kept in contact with the gentleman who's in charge of housing development, and no shade against that gentleman. He's a pleasant guy to work with. I think he, he, he did his portion, but there's only so much that one man can do. So right. after that avenue was exhausted, we were like, ugh, we could spend another two or three years jumping through hoops with brick and mortar banks and have a sizable debt service. Cause you know, the interest rate on $2.3 million, that's a that's a heavy carrying cost. Or all investments are for the purpose of making money. Let's make some money. So technically we sold out, but at the end of the day, we tried our best. We didn't screw anybody over. We learned a whole heck of a lot. We got a master's level education in urban development without having to attend a university. And our investors are happy. We're very happy. And the thing is, we're gonna turn around and um, you and I have had personal conversations. I'm not gonna go out and buy a Tesla. <laughs> I'm gonna go out and put my money into the next investment. So it might be multifamily. It might be dirt. As a matter of fact, my wife and I have uh, eight infill lots under contract right now where we're going to build with our construction company. So that's part of the doors that we're adding. And that wasn't even from this transaction. That was from another transaction. So we might just go out and buy some more houses to flip or some more buy and holds or some more dirt to build on. So it'll be used for the same purpose. It might just be at a smaller scale. And then a different, you know, I, I got you, got you. You're right. I felt like in this time frame that I've been talking to you, I've got a master's level education on development piece. Oh, there's, there's, there's so much that we learned by hustle and the goodwill of others. Um, there's still some we don't know, but everything from terminology, capital stack, how you get your financing together, how they will underwrite a deal, how they'll look at your pro forma. These are things that you just can't learn from YouTube, unfortunately. So there's a couple of ways to learn them. One, you can literally go to school. You know, you can get a degree or a certificate in real estate development or urban development. Or two, you can go old school and apprentice. You can essentially internship for someone or work from someone at an entry level job and find that information. You know, you may not have the wherewithal to, I don't know where you are in life, but maybe take a pay decrease, uh, a pay um, decrease to go and, and work for someone and learn. 
but I know people who've done just that. Uh, a gentleman who helped us out a ton, he came from the IT field. He quit his well-paying job in AT in IT, went and worked for a developer for a few years, making a third of his previous salary. He learned the ropes, and now he's on his tenth development project, where he's built, you know, forty-unit condos and things of that nature. Uh, we reached out to a lot of people. We were humble, and we were open, and we were honest, and we asked for help. Some people said, sure, I'll help you. Come to my office. I'll look over your pro forma and I'll shoot holes in it. And that's exactly what they did. They said, hey, you're going to lose money right here. You can't afford to do this. This is all effed up. This is what you need to do. We took down our notepads and we fixed it. Or someone said, yeah, I, I don't have time to help you, but here's so-and-so's business card. You call them and tell them that I told them to give you a meeting. Okay, sure, great. So that's why we were adamant about not burning bridges, not doing anyone dirty in this project, in this process, because we, we received a lot of help and it's a small development world. Once you get um, the inkling of stench on you, it follows you. There were people that we talked to and we'd be like, hey, we just had a, we just had a meeting with Joe Blow. And they'd be like, nah, leave Joe Blow alone. Don't talk to him. Don't don't deal with him. Leave Joe Blow alone. Joe Blow is toxic. And then lo and behold, six months later, we saw Joe Blow under federal indictment. So yeah. Wow, man. It's, it's, a, it's a small development world, especially for people who look like you and I. And that's what it that's what attracted me to uh, your story. Uh, it's not many people that are um, that are doing, you know, looking to develop uh, land um, that look like us, and then that are you're able to touch them and talk to them. You know, yeah. I've, I've I've come across a couple of people, and they were doing something similar, but I've never heard back from them. I heard from you. You said, listen, I'm going to grab something to eat. Let's set a meeting. <laughs> Let's set a meeting. We on You honored the meeting, and here we are tonight. So I don't take it lightly, man, that you were uh, willing to share that information with uh, myself and my listeners. Um, so for those who would like to reach out to you, um, whether it's social media or through email or phone number, tell us how we can get in touch with you. Well, I, I will always answer questions to the best of my ability. I will always give as much time as I have the ability to give, whether it's for you or anyone else, because I had so much help along the way. Uh, so the best way to reach me is via email, and that's info, I-N-F-O, at Realtor, R-E-A-L-T-O-R. First name Keith, K-E-I-T-H. Last name Stone, S T O N E dot com. Info at realtorkeithstone.com. That's the best way to reach me. Um, you can follow me on social media, but it's mostly just pictures of my kids. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I mean, it's substance, but you're not going to yeah, get you know, any tips or anything, no nah, questions answered. Yeah. <laughs> There's very little of my real estate business on social media. Gotcha. That's because I prefer to walk softly and carry a big stick. Gotcha. You definitely do, man. You definitely do. Man, Keith, it was an amazing opportunity to talk to you. Um, I appreciate your time and I look forward to uh, working with you and talking to you in the future about your endeavors, man. Um, and this is go ahead. Thank you for having me as a guest. And I, I appreciate what you're doing, just spreading information and spreading knowledge. Because I looked for any and every source that I could along the way. And a lot of the things I learned, I learned the hard way via failure. So I would hope that other people could find resources like yours. And they don't have to learn from the school of hard knocks. They can have it easier and they can go further than I did next time. Got you, man. Well, we appreciate you. This is the Real Estate Proverbs Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Jefferson. Have a great night.
If you like this podcast, please like, subscribe, share, and comment. And I'm your host, Kevin Jefferson. Have a great day.